Amen. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 8. Um, the, the main text that we're doing as we finish up Ephesians is Ephesians chapter 6 today. That's going to be the final word from Paul in the Ephesians letter. But I want to start us with this scene of Jesus and his disciples because it's going to give us a way to understand what I think Paul is really after. So Jesus and the disciples, and they're on the Sea of Galilee, and there's a storm. And if you know the story of Jesus and his disciples, this actually happens multiple times. So watch how it unfolds. Verse 23, as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. Man, that says it all, doesn't it? It's about to be a storm. Jesus is going to be sleeping because that's just how he rolls. The man's got peace. He's strong. He's stable. He doesn't get upset. I just love that. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water. And they were in real danger. And the disciples went and woke him up because he's sleeping still, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And when Jesus finally woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. And suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. And here's really where it takes a turn. Look at verse 25. Then Jesus asked them, that's the disciples, where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obey him. And Jesus is looking at them saying, where's your faith? Now watch the tone here. Because you could read this with a tone in Jesus' voice that's not in the text. He's not saying, what's your problem? Where's your faith? Idiot. Peter, I call it out just because some of us inherently, when we come to the scripture, we read tone into God's words that aren't there in the text. Be very, very careful. One of the things we've been talking about for the last year is that God gives us his word and then he expects us to follow his word. He expects us to walk with him, not because he's all judgy with us. It's not about that. It's not about unreasonable expectations. It's about the fact that a good, loving parent expects their children to do the right thing. And that expectation has a way of lifting them along the right road, doesn't it? And so Jesus does the same thing here and he stops for a moment and he looks at the disciples and says, where is your faith? He doesn't say you need to go create some faith. He doesn't say you need to increase your faith. Very specific. He says, where is it? Where is it? Because guys, it was right here and you didn't put it on. It was right here. You could have just grabbed it and maybe you would have made it through this situation a little bit differently. Where's your faith? Go get it, guys. Go get it. It's very interesting. Um, if they had grabbed hold of their faith in the moment, what would have happened? Some commentators are like, well, maybe they could have calmed the storm. I don't think so. I think that's a Jesus thing. Amen. I think that's a divine command over the weather kind of a thing. But... Maybe they didn't have to so fall into panic that they turn into a pile of goo in the middle of the boat. Because that's kind of what they emotionally did. And, and, and don't you know, there's 12 disciples that are there. The very first disciple that starts to fall into panic, you guys know how panic works, right? Panic is contagious. So the first one that gives into that terror and into that fear and into that panic, it starts to spread to all of them. How long were they like that? before Jesus finally calmed the storm? See, I think what Jesus is saying is, guys, if you'd have just taken hold of your faith, maybe the last five minutes didn't have to be so miserable. And sometimes we're that way in the storms of our own life, right? Sometimes we're going through it and we've got all these resources that God has made available to us spiritually, but they're sitting in the bottom of the boat and we're not using them. It's, it's a call to a Christianity that walks. A call to Christianity that stands on its own legs because it's got strong legs. It's not a call to self-reliance, by the way. Again, I don't know that they have the ability to calm the storm. And you're going to see that as we go along. This is not a call for Christians grow up and stand on your own without God. That's not what this is. God does enjoy rescuing you. But he enjoys it 
when you call on him to rescue you. See, this isn't about self-reliance either. It's about Jesus' reliance. It's about faith reliance. That's what the armor of God is going to be. And you're going to see this here in a second. Ephesians 6, chapter t- or verse 10. Paul says, one final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. All of Ephesians we've been going through. This has been truth that sings the beauty of Paul's poetry and the way he takes these deep spiritual concepts and he gives us illustrations for what they actually mean so that we can access them. Paul's brilliant. And this is one of his final ones. He says, I got one final word before I close this letter. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you may be able, may be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Now I highlighted stand there because he's gonna say stand multiple times. So this is your homework in the next few minutes. Count how many times he says stand because it's gonna be a lot. Stand against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. There's two things I want to pull out here. The first one is, he says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against people. You're like, well, pastor, it feels like a lot of days I'm fighting against people. Anybody feel that? The church would be really great if it wasn't for all the Christians in it, yeah? Yeah. Sometimes that's how it feels. Sometimes like my community wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for all the broken people in it. And on and on it goes. Because it feels like when we're in our toughest times, our darkest times, that we're right in the middle of crisis, it feels like what I'm working against is people that are right in front of me. I'll just tell you this. In walking with God, this is one of the scriptures he constantly, the Holy Spirit, constantly brings me back to. Joshua, You're treating this situation like you're fighting against people and it's not about flesh and blood. It's about the spiritual battle that's behind them. Stop blaming them. Stop working against them. Stop attacking my people. Stop stop criticizing and judging my people. Instead, get on your knees. And start praying about the spiritual battle. Start praying about the, the, the forces that are influencing these people. It's a different approach. And you do less damage to others. They are not the problem. Um, secondly, there is, I just need to say this before we go any further. There is a very real kingdom of darkness. And Paul makes it really clear in that passage. Satan is an ancient being. He is a singular person. We talk about the kingdom of darkness, but Satan is an individual fallen angel that has existed since the beginning of time. He has demons. These are fallen angels. Revelation speaks of that. A third of the angels followed Satan in the civil war in heaven and they fell and they became demons. Hollywood likes to make them look like dark bats and whatever. None of that's right. They're fallen angels. They no longer obey God. They hate God and they hate you. Um, I've spoken about the the demonic organization that Satan runs. I've spoken about it multiple times here. So I'm just going to pull this out for you. You can go out onto our YouTube channel or go to our website and look through our archive of messages and you'll find these two in the You Asked For It series from 2022 and 2021. You asked me to talk about angels and demons both years. Those are both still out there. I did nothing but just preach on how that whole thing works. I'm not going to do that today. I'm not going to retread that same ground today because I want to get to the part that Paul is talking about is how do we stand against them? Because today, the thrust of today is, hey, they exist. Let's figure out practically speaking, how do we stand in the midst of battle? And I want to give you that. So verse 13 Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Now, I gave you the Greek there not to be fancy, but that Greek word, I'm just giving it to you briefly because what they uh, translate it as resist in the original Greek, it means to stand against. And I'm counting stands. I don't know if you heard that before. I'm counting stands and this means to stand against. So I get credit for that one. Resist, stand against the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. 
So stand your ground. How many have you got? Three, four, five. We're not so much math, are we? It's all right. It's all right. We've got other strengths. Um, <laughs> let's get to the armor. So we're supposed to stand for sure. Uh, verse 14, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. I'm going to leave this slide up for a few minutes because I'm going to talk you through every single piece of the armor. The body armor of God's righteousness for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. Okay, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna walk you through these different pieces of armor one at a time, but I'll say this before we get started. The armor of God, what you're gonna see here are all these tools that God makes available to us so that we can what? Stand. The context is, I'm on a battlefield. I'm coming against an enemy, and an enemy is coming against me. Imagine the fury of an entire army coming at you spiritually, and he's not saying, I want you to take ground. He's saying, I just want you to stand. Because as believers, it sure does feel like we get knocked down a lot. You ever feel that? Sometimes it feels like the faith can be a passive thing. This is not a passive thing. And God's will for your life is not that you get knocked down all the time. He's giving you the tools to stand. Amen. And that's what this is about. Some of you have been taught this passage before in a way that you kind of came out of it. And it felt like a Sunday school lesson where if the only way that you could use this was to memorize really well all the different parts of the armor and what they all stand for and all the... I don't think that's it. I think Paul's giving you some nuance here, but I think the big thing that you need to remember today is God gave me body armor. Yes. God gave me armor. I can either put it on or not put it on. And some of you are going to leave today and you're like, okay, I, I remember the shield of faith. That's about it. Let me just say, I think that's great progress. And I think that's fine. And if you start mixing up pieces of armor, I don't think God's going to not answer your prayers because of it. Can I get a better amen? amen? Okay. It's a metaphor. It's to help you understand these tools. So first off is the belt of truth. And the belt holds everything together. And why is it a belt of truth? Because Satan's the father of lies. That's what Jesus calls him. He is classic for telling us lies and these lies destroy our lives. And he's smart about it. He likes to twist the truth. He tries to take just a little bit of actual truth and then twist it with lies. It leads the world astray. So Jesus said in John 8, 32, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. free. The truth will set you free. Okay, next is the body armor of righteousness or the breastplate, some of your translations say. Um, the body armor of righteousness means that you're trying to do the right thing. Righteousness, doing right. And so there's a truth that in your life, and this might sound like a tall order, but whatever your temptations are, whatever you're struggling with, whatever's before you, when you do the right thing, you win a battle. Do you know what I'm saying? When you do the right thing, there's a way in which Satan gets silenced by that because he's the guy who wants to come in with shame and his unforgiveness and his accusation about, how, you know, that's how he does. But when we've done the right thing, it shuts him down. Now, we don't always do the right thing, and I'm going to get to that in just a, just a quick second. But First John is really, really clear that when we walk in the light as he is in the light, we know we're children of the light. We grow confident that we are part of God's family as we walk out the will of God. It increases our confidence. So whether or not you fight the temptation and win, it actually matters. Just want to say that. But let's say you don't win. Let's say you fail. Let's say you give in to that addiction just one more time. Now the enemy is going to come in and he's going to tell you that you aren't forgiven and he's going to talk about shame and he's going to talk about accusation. He's going to take all your confidence away. That's where you need that breastplate, breastplate of righteousness the most. Amen. Why? Because the breastplate of righteousness really is Jesus's righteousness, not yours. 
See, Jesus lived the perfect life and he did what was right in every single moment of his life. And Jesus's perfect righteous resume, scripture says that got attributed to your account when you got saved. So before God the Father, he looks at you with rose-colored glasses. He sees the righteousness of his son. So the next time Satan comes to you and he says, you suck, you get to say, no, I've got the righteousness of Jesus. This is all God sees in me done. Next, the shoes of peace. This is the peace that you get from the gospel because you are saved, because you have the righteousness of Jesus you have peace. What does that mean? Where are my people pleasers at? Right? Most of us. Here's the real struggle with people pleasing is I want everybody in the room to be happy with me. I struggle to go to sleep at night if not everybody is happy with me. The shoes of peace, what that says is God is at peace with me. He approves of me. He loves me. And if I can center myself on that, then nothing else matters. I get stability from that. The gospel of peace means I have peace and I have a peace that matters. Now, can I take that and still be a people pleaser? Heck yeah, I can. But I'm not putting on the armor. Put it on. Jesus would say, go get it. Where's it at? No, you've got real peace that matters. Next is the shield of faith. Faith is this idea that's kind of so broad and I like the fact that he uses the picture of a shield for it because I can move it around and I can protect whatever vulnerable part of my body that I need to. So whatever kind of arrow is being shot at me, whatever kind of lie, whatever kind of doubt, whatever kind of temptation is coming my way, I can believe God with that shield. It's my belief. It's my faith. Faith is what the disciples didn't have in the boat. Jesus says, where's it at? Go get it. Next, the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation has the picture of like, I'm protecting my head. I'm protecting my brain, protecting my mind, protecting my thought life. And Satan likes to attack us there. He likes to hit us with the anxieties. He likes to hit us with the worries and with the fears. It's the helmet of salvation that comes in and says, no matter where this world goes, I know where I'm going. I know where my security comes from. I'm saved and that's finished and that's done. Next is the sword of the spirit. This is the only offensive weapon in the list. So I'm not just standing, I'm actually able to fight with it. The sword of the spirit, it says the word of God in your translations. The Greek there is the rhema, R-H-E-M-A, the rhema. Now that's important because there's three main Greek words used whenever the word of God appears in your English there. It's either um, the scriptures, which is the writings, is the literal word there, or it's the logos, which is the, the knowledge or the wisdom of God. And Jesus is also often called the logos. In John chapter one, it says the word was with God and the word was God. That's logos. Often when you see word of God, it's logos and it's referring to Jesus himself. Amen. The third one is rhema, which is when you take God's word and you speak it. It's spoken. It's out loud. And so I'm telling you all that just to say, when he says you grab the sword, what he's saying is you're speaking the scripture out loud. It's one thing to have it in a book. You're not throwing a book at Satan, amen? You're taking it out and you're using it in the moment. You see Jesus most clearly do this. When he was tempted in the wilderness and Satan came against him with three main temptations and Satan came, or Jesus went back against Satan with the rhema of God's word. He took the Old Testament scripture and he used it in the moment out loud against Satan. Sometimes we have to speak it out loud, not only for him, but for us. Amen. Amen. We need it for us as well. There's this moment where uh, Satan, one of his temptations was, hey, Jesus, here's all you're going to have to do. Just bow before me. Can you imagine Jesus bowing to Satan? He says, just bow before me. If you bow before me, he says, I'll give you the whole world and all the kingdoms. And what was he really offering Jesus? What I believe he was offering Jesus was you can have all of humanity and you don't have to go to the cross to do it. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to die. I'm going to give you a shortcut. I'm going to give you an easy way. The only problem is it's not the way God the Father had told Jesus to do it. 
and certainly not to bow before Satan. And so Jesus responds to him with these words. He says, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. That's an Old Testament quote, Rhema. Let's talk about Peter, poor Peter. (laughs) Peter always gets picked on. But I want you to see, what I want you to see uh, in Peter is a little bit like the storm with the boat I want you to see what the armor of God would have done for Peter in these different situations. Um, This is Luke 22, verse 31. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. And let me pause there really quick. So the scene here is, this is at the last supper before Jesus goes to the cross. So he's not been arrested yet. And Jesus makes a reference to the fact that the the disciples are gonna scatter. And Peter, of course, steps up and says, not me, Jesus. Maybe these losers will scatter, but not me. I'm gonna be with you. And Jesus says, Peter, Simon, Satan already asked to sift you like wheat. Now here's the picture. In the old days, they would take grain and it would have chaff, this real lightweight flaky stuff on it that you didn't wanna eat or make part of your bread. And they would shake it, throw it up in the wind. The chaff would blow away and just leave the good stuff behind. What Jesus is saying is, Peter, Satan came to God the Father at his throne and he asked for all of you disciples to sift you to where no wheat grain would be left. Which is what had happened with Judas. Judas had been tempted and tried and there was no faith left over with Judas. He says, Satan has asked for the same for you. The great encouragement of that passage, by the way, is that Satan can do nothing to you that he hasn't asked permission to do from God the Father. Do you know that? That's not just in this situation. That's all through the scripture, specifically Job chapter one. Go to Job chapter one and two, and you're gonna see this scene unfold where Satan has to go to God the Father at the throne and ask to do things to Job. And God tells him exactly what he can and cannot do. You may go this far and no further. That's what's going on every single day of your life, by the way. So Satan had asked for the disciples and Jesus said, but I prayed for you. So this isn't going to happen to you. But he doesn't say it's all gonna be rosy. You're still gonna deny me three times, right? But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So you're not gonna fail So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. It's such an interesting mix of what Jesus says. He's like, you're not gonna fail, but when you repent. So (laughs) many of us would still call that failure, right? What Jesus means is your faith isn't gonna fail. You're gonna sin. You're gonna do the right things, the wrong thing, Simon but you're not going to be crushed by this the way Satan wanted. And when you're not crushed by this and then you repent, I want you to come in the spirit of forgiveness that I'm gonna give to you and you're gonna strengthen the other disciples with the forgiveness that you get. It's a powerful picture. Um, So then leave this one for a second. After Jesus says all that, some of you guys know the story. Jesus gets arrested. And he gets taken off to the, um, to the high priest's house in the middle of the night. And Peter and John follow behind him. And Peter's there in the courtyard and warming himself by the fire while Jesus is being interrogated. And Peter gets confronted by someone who thinks maybe he is one of the disciples of Jesus. And he denies. He steps right into the sin that Jesus said that he was gonna step into. Can I just call out for a second? I think Peter's first mistake was his overconfidence in himself. He said, I would never do that. If that's the road you're going down, pride comes before a fall, folks. Mm -hmm. Don't go there. See, it's not about you being strong enough to handle the day of evil. It's about you and Jesus being able to stand against it together. It's about the fact that you put the armor on and then you can stand. But if you're going to take away from the message today that this just means I need to grow up and stand up on my own two feet alone, no, that's not it. That's self-reliance. That's not what this message is about. 
because Peter tried that and Peter failed. So what he should have done was taken up his shield of faith when they came against him. Right? He should have said, even though they're asking me if I'm a disciple, I should believe that Jesus has got me and I should tell him the truth. That's what he should have done. And then after his first denial, he denies a second time and he denies a third time. Why does he do that? It's interesting, isn't it? Have you ever found yourself fall into sin once and then the second time is 10 times easier? And then the third time is even easier after that? You know what you're doing? You're kind of spiraling, right? You're kind of binging on that sin. And we use that kind of terminology for alcoholics. They, they spiral and they, they, they go into, why, why, why do we do that? Why do we find ourselves failing one time and then all of a sudden we fail some more? Is it because, so I'm just going to guess here, because I think it's smart for us to take a look underneath it. Is it because Satan comes against us between denial one and denial two and says things like, you already failed once. What's another one? You already failed once. You're already a son of hell. You're already on my team. So what's the big deal? You already failed once. You're, you're going to have to finally wake up and ask for forgiveness at some point. What's the big deal? This shame that you're going to feel, you're going to feel it anyway. So just why not just do it again? Do you see what he does? I imagine him saying all of that to Peter. And the angels are like, <laughs> shouting back, no, put on the breastplate. Remember, Peter, you're righteous. Remember, Peter, you failed. But you got the righteousness of Jesus in you. Amen. And what does that mean? First John 1 John 9. It means all you do is whisper a prayer of, uh, of, of confession to God and you're forgiven in the moment. You're immediately forgiven. All the, all the sin, all the unforgiveness, all the shame is gone in a moment. You could have reset between denial one and denial two, Peter. But he doesn't take it up. Go get the breastplate, Peter. See how things could have been different. This is what the armor is. The attacks come from a lot of places. Let me talk about where the attacks come from. The first one is Satan. We've already discussed that. But there's more. And I want, I want to show you guys the expanded list here. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Like, we're always on the menu for him, yeah? It's the way that it works. And when Satan is coming against you, his attacks are probably going to look like fear. They're probably going to look like doubts, causing you to doubt your salvation, doubt that God is good, doubt that his word is true. You've experienced that before. Fear and worry as a consistent thing tend to come from him. And, and, and the lies and the false teaching and the twisting of scripture. And some of you guys have been to other churches or you've been part of other traditions where Scripture has been twisted for you, and you're kind of unwinding some of that right now. That has been the influence of the enemy. Let me say briefly, um, even things like the occult, even things like fortune telling, um, even things like astrology, and sometimes you see that in bookstores and you're like, it's no big deal, it's in a bookstore. Those things are destructive. Those things are opportunities for you to walk down a dark road that pretends that there are no real dark forces behind those things, and there are. Those are doorways, guys. Those are, don't get into that. Uh, there's destruction on the other side of that. The scripture talks about giving the enemy a foothold in your life. Don't give the enemy a foothold in your life. Next is the world. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. Do you see that there? Yes, he does, he's defining this, this idea that the world is a system, and the world runs on its own priorities and values. And he just spelled it out for you. The way the world works, it's all about seeking the next pleasure. It's also all about having pride in your own accomplishments and seeing value. My value has to do with not who I am, but the things that I accomplish. That is the wrong road. That's the world system. That is not Jesus' system. 
And if you give into that, you are under attack. It's also the accumulation of more and more things and you'll never be satisfied. There'll be no contentment or peace going down that road. That's the way the world comes at you. The next one is your sin nature, James 1.14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So he's saying all the temptations towards sin in your life are actually from you. You're broken. I, I say this just, again, to expand, because Paul is hyper-focused on, on spiritual warfare today, and that's absolutely part of it. But I don't want you to think that I'm up here looking for a demon under every rock in my life. I'm not. And I certainly don't blame demons or the devil for when I'm tempted to sin. I've got enough brokenness inside of me to get along with, right? Amen. Now let's look at our broken minds. Elijah sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. This is an Old Testament prophet, a powerful prophet that knew God. And he just prayed a suicidal tendency right there. Do you catch that? Notice some other aspects of what he just did. It says that he sat down under a solitary broom tree. He was, he was isolating himself. Isn't that what we do when we get in a dark place? We isolate ourselves. We speak the things out loud, even sometimes to God. And then he says, I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. You start comparing yourself to the heroes of the past and saying, I don't measure up. Comparison doesn't do you any good. But he falls into all of these things and it's because his mind is broken in the moment. God's got grace for him in the moment. Mental suffering is a huge thing that we wrestle with. I spoke about um, mental health right here at this church last year. Really took our time walking through that slowly. In the midst of this discussion, this is part of what some of us are really wrestling with, an anxiety, a, a depression, a, um, perfectionism, um, things that we feel like our par for the course is not the same as somebody else's par for the course, if you know what I mean. We start in a darker place. We start in a weaker place than other people that we know do. We wrestle with this thing more than other people wrestle with it. Again, people pleasing, needing to control, part of the struggle that we have. Two years ago at Halloween, our family dressed up um, as these characters here. Just wanted to give you a lighthearted moment today. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, anyway, this, these are the characters from Inside Out, the movie, if you've ever seen Inside Out, the movie. And um, I'm on the end there, and that was just um, uncomfortably close to my deeper personality, so I've never done it again. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I love this little movie, uh, Inside Out. Um, one of the things I love about it, there's just all kinds of things I feel like Pixar got right there. Um, and I feel like now's the moment to talk about it when I talk about our broken mind. Sometimes we can get down on ourselves and we can get negative about who we are. One of the things that, that Inside Out movie did really well, I thought, was they called out all the different emotions that are in the control room of our brains. And they made the point that those emotions are not bad in and of themselves. They actually have a lot of good to them. And depending on the situation, you might want to call up anxiety in the right situation. You might want to call up fear when there's a hot stove that you don't want to put your hand on. There's a lot of times when you want to call those things up. What really matters, and this is where they got the, the, the whole uh, metaphor really, really good. What matters is who's in control. Because who's in control can either be really good or be really bad. And I love that they brought anxiety into the second movie as well and put anxiety in control and just showed what happened. But it's a great lesson for us because what I think inside out gets right is so much, but what they might have missed is that I think for the Christian, there's one more person in the control room. And you might say it's faith. You might say it's the armor. 
You might say it's Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit in the control room with you. The question is who's in control? Because sometimes that's just, that's just what we're doing. When Jesus says, go get your faith, where was it? Is he saying, you let fear be in control in the boat, guys. Don't let him be in control. Sometimes in a, I'm in situations where I walk people through their struggles. They talk to me about, have you ever been in those conversations? A, fa uh, a family member or a friend? And they come and they just explain, this is what I'm struggling with right now. And if you're blessed to be in a conversation like that, let me just say quickly, you need to active listen when you're in a moment like that. Don't rush to solution. Don't be a fixer. Let them talk. Amen. And listen deeply. Don't be on your phone, right? Say back to them what they've been saying to you. Let them get out all the detail. Ask them questions. But let, this is my struggle today. Let them say all of that. And once you've summarized back to them, once you've done what you can to love and show compassion in the moment as their brother or sister in Christ, you say all of that to them, then you can ask, would it be possible for me to share something, maybe from God's word, that I think speaks to the situation? And wait for them to say yes, by the way. Sometimes I rush it. When they say yes, then you've got an opportunity to help them with their armor. I spoke with a guy recently, and he's just, he just got saved this year. And he didn't expect the enemy to come against him as a new Christian and to make things so hard. He didn't expect all these doubts to come about his own life. And we were just talking about some of the passages in scripture, like, you know, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Like it talks about it as if it's done, past tense. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Tell that to your doubts. What am I doing? I'm trying to help my brother put on his armor. Some of you older Christians, it, this is how it kind of gets you is, is, yeah, I believed that I was saved, but now I find myself falling into the old sin that I used to fall into. And I find myself giving in to that. And when I give in to that, I get so down on myself because I know better. And I've been walking with Jesus so long. How in the world could I fall into this again? And do you see what the enemy's doing to you? Oh, let me talk to you about the fact that when God forgave you for that, it says that he threw that into his sea of forgetfulness. And if God forgets that, why are you remembering it? Amen. Why are you swimming in that ocean with all your old sins? You're not called to do that. Live in the blessing that he gave you. Get that breastplate of righteousness on. Like, let me help you with that, brother. Like, this is what we have to do. We need to do it with each other. We need to do it with ourselves. It takes practice, doesn't it? You got that person who sometimes you talk to and they've experienced abuse in their past. And that abuse, I'll take this carefully. So much gets sown into a human soul in a moment like that. I must be worth nothing if that was done to me. I must have done something to invite that. It must be my fault somehow. God must have been nowhere around and maybe I don't matter to him. Do you hear the lies that have gotten lodged into that soul? And then you get the benefit of, let, let me help you with your armor. No, see, Genesis says that you were made in the image of God. And because you were made in the image of God, no matter what you've done in this life, you were born on the first day, the very first moment you took breath, you had value to God. You had dignity before God. So when somebody came against you and used you like that, they violated divine justice. 
that the father in heaven, when that took place, was furious. See, sometimes we don't think that we like justice, but the truth is he is full of divine justice and I thank him for it. And for those that I've seen walking in woundedness, they need to know that he's furious at what took place and that he was there and that he wants their healing. See, these are the deep things that we're bringing our armor to all the time in order to get sometimes slow healing for the wounds that are really there in us. Let me help you with your armor. Make sense? This is what God wants for us. Okay, let's wrap this up. Tony Stark, Iron Man. Got to lighten this thing up. You ever see a picture of Tony Stark without his armor on? Here's the thing. He's a pretty small guy. He's not much of an Avenger at all. If you threw him out on a battlefield with the enemy coming against him without that armor, what do you think he's got? He's got nothing. You're like, well, he's got his brain. What's that going to do against Thanos? Not much. (laughs) Not much at all. He's going down. He's getting knocked down immediately. It is the armor that helps him stand just to bring it all back around. And I love the picture of him sitting on this couch with his empty casing of armor right next to him. And if I could just say, what a picture of a lot of us as Christians. All of this available right here. Jesus saying, where'd you put it? Is it in the closet? Go get it. Put it on. It's not doing you any good in the closet. Put it on. That's... That's what makes sense. And and all of a sudden you and I are working together and that's the way it's supposed to work. And I got one more picture of Tony here. You might remember this scene. It's when he first puts his boots on and tries to figure out how to fly. And he's in his garage and, and it's a big clumsy deal. It's super funny. It's played for, for comic stuff and it's, it's just great. But here's the thing. See this verse? Verse 13, I'm gonna take you back there real quick. It says, put on every piece of God's armor, Paul says, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. What's he saying there? Some of your translations say, on the evil day or in the day of evil. What Paul's saying is, whatever you're going through right now, you're probably not going through what you're going to go through. There's an evil day that is coming in your life. So I need you to put on the armor now. Why? Because you're no good at it yet. You need to put it on and you need to get used to how to use it in all the little temptations and all the little attacks in your life, the daily stuff right now, that's the gold. That's the time to start using it so that when the day of evil comes, you're ready. Does that make sense? Why don't you guys stand? God doesn't want us getting knocked down over and over and over again. He's got better for us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you, God, that you've provided these tools, God, that you've not abandoned us. You've not left us on our own. We don't want to be self-reliant. We don't want to get knocked down either. We want to be Jesus-reliant today, Lord, so show us. Behind all this, Lord, we can see it. It's your love for us. God, you want good things. Help us to walk with you. In Christ's name, amen.